Welcome everyone. I'm Emma. I'm one of the librarians here at Rockland Public Library and we're thrilled to be hosting tonight's art history talk. Uh, I want to start off the night with a couple quick programming notes on upcoming virtual events at the library. Next week on June 3rd, science writer Margie Patlack will be discussing her book More Than Meets the Eye. And the following week on June 10th, classical guitarist Carlos Pavan will be giving a virtual performance. And I'm happy to introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Michael Grillo is professor of art at the University of Maine. He writes on how Italian 14th century images operate as primary sources that visually articulate ideas inexpressible in any other media, including the verbal realm. Dr. Grillo received his PhD from Cornell University with a dissertation on medieval history of art. He continued this work with his 1997 book, Symbolic Structures, the Role of Composition in Signaling Meaning in Italian Late Medieval Painting. He is also a practicing photographer and seeks to explore how aesthetic series play out directly in application in our world, particularly how photography operates as a cultural specific visual modality. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Grillo, go right ahead. Many buttons, okay. So um, thank you, Em, very much for, for inviting me in to give this talk. Um, this is a talk that by all means, please feel free to interrupt and ask questions as you will. Um, I will try to pay attention to the chat as well, but that's doing two things at once, three things at once, and I'm not always very good at that. Um, I'm going to look at largely 14th century Italy, a period of time which has a great fluorescence um, a renovation, uh, which we later term Renaissance. And it's one which in the first half of the century is viewed with great optimism, great opportunity. But then the 1340s happen. And the 1340s are a don't ever set your time machine to go back to 1340s um, in, in Italy because it's a period of time when first there's a series about a three-year period of crop failures followed by bank failures followed by uttering the magic words it can't get any worse than this followed by the 1348 great plague which decimated populations of cities between you know between 30 and 80 percent 30 and 90 percent of some cities so this is a century which has received a lot of attention in terms of cataclysm and obviously appropriate to our pandemic era that we are in now. Now, I want to set the talk up in many ways by looking to how, how we construct history. Because in the modernist era, Really, that notion of history is one which is relatively linear, that it's one which progresses, uh, which goes forward in a manner that um, constantly is, uh, what shall we say, improving, uh, things are discovered, always looking forward. And any interruption of that is viewed, of course, as, oh, backtracking in failure. But of course, we live in a world that we know is not so linear. And it's one which really, when we look for linearity in history, it really distorts our understanding of the past. Uh, very typically, you have this notion that the late medieval and early uh, 14th century had somehow magically an idea of where the era of uh, Michelangelo and Raphael would be 200 years later, and we're somehow aiming for it. And of course, we know full well that that type of envisioning many centuries off is, you know, it's, it's, it's nonsense, quite frankly. Um, but when Italian Renaissance is frequently taught, it's taught in many ways as almost a progression and study of perspective. And before you, you have Perugino's Christ Giving the Keys to St. Peter from the late 15th century. It's on the walls of the Sistine Chapel. And it's one which really underscores how perspective works as an ordering agent and as one which gives spatial detail, spatial reference, and works. And I'll be talking about Alberti shortly. 
it works in many ways as sort of a, a window into an extension of our world. Now, for us, it's a very normative vision because we have been very shaped by this vision through, of course, 500 years of history and some technological fulfillment. Very typically, when people are tracing out this notion of the development and invention of perspective, and you will find a lot of uh, books written in the 30s, 40s, 50s, um, 60s of last century, which really endlessly talk about, you know, this sort of strive forward perspective as, as the Renaissance contribution. Um, very typically, and if I can get my, there we go. Very typically, um, you'll see models of that Perugino. You will also see images such as this is by Masaccio, and it's a, um, an earlier 15th century um, fresco. We will be returning to it. But I've accompanied it with this model of an experiment in optics. And you can see that this is one, and I don't know if my cursor is showing up on yours, um, but you can see it's one where the viewer looks both simultaneously through to the object that he is looking at, but also is seeing the reflection in a mirror from another mirror of the scene before him. In other words, the mapping of the world onto his own vision. Um, and somebody has just put up Arnheim's name, certainly a reference well looking into. Now, and let me see if I can get, yes, we can go forward. Um, this notion of a mechanical approach to perspective is one which is distinctly um, recorded. What you have here is an illustration by Albrecht Dürer in the early 16th century. And what you have is a mechanical device where the assistant touches a piece on the lute and you can see that it's attached to a string. The artist holds his pen or pencil there and then shuts this trap door so that the pencil touches onto, or I should say the pen touches onto the surface. And by doing this diligently is able to map perspective onto the screen, um, onto, onto the picture. And you can see that the 15th century is full of some rather radical notions of perspective. Um, you have this trompe l'oeil uh, um, image, which is in a ceiling of the Camera degli Sposi in uh, Mantua. And it's one where, of course, as you are in that room and look up, it looks like, of course, an opening into the sky. And you can see these radically foreshortened bodies, which really, it's Montaigne showing off just how well he has mastered perspective. Now we have inherited it because we have inherited it through the mechanical devices of the Camera Ob Obscura, um, as well, which was used throughout the 17th century by artists such as Vermeer. And it was a mechanical device that allowed the, you know, the artist to trace what he saw optically reflected in a mirror. And Vermeer, of course, did you, as did his contemporaries, use this device. And of course, we have inherited it with photography, um, basically an 1830s invention, which fulfills that notion of, um, of the mechanical device that can record what is in front of us. Now, again, if I can get this thing to advance, there we go. What I wanna do is step back and look to the ambience that led to that 14th century sense of optimism and everything else, what Petrarch termed the Renovatio Romani, the Roman revival, what, again, what we call um, the, the, the Renaissance. The period in the 12th and 13th centuries was a period of the development of several ideas that coalesced together that were largely populist ideas. Italian city-states up to this point had been largely collections of noble families who each 
would have control over a section of a city. And each of these towers, these are battlement towers, are basically defendable palaces in which, you know, the city is basically a, um, what shall we say, an amalgamation of like 15 strong families, each controlling a neighborhood, almost like gangs and tagging. I mean, that type of sense of total control. In the 12th century, the merchants, the rising merchant class of Italy, begins to realize that the city is better off if it is legislated as a single unit and not just a collection of families that are constantly at each other's throats. What they do is most of the city-states across the 12th century will require all of these powerful families to disable, to take down their towers, to stop their defenses. And they will allow these nobles to keep their fortunes and their titles, but they can no longer participate in politics. They are barred. So it's a disenfranchisement of the traditional nobles. The feudal order ends. And what replaces it? Now, this is the city of San Gimignano, and it's one of the few cities that has kept its towers. Um, but other cities like Florence, as you look across in this panorama, you see that lo and behold, there's only really a few dominant towers. And they are, of course, the cathedral. Okay, the smaller tower was their first city hall, a public communal city hall. All of the towers that would have been to the local families have been removed. And all you see are a few church spires, the old city hall, and then the rising new city hall. So this notion of a unified city state, one which is a guild democracy, meaning that the larger labor unions are the, um, are the principal controllers of the government, in a limited set of elections, um, not just uh, men, but in fact, men who are um, within particular useful labors of the city were granted votes. And you can see that this is really the notion of a centralized unified city. Now, the Palazzo Vecchio, this is the principal city hall from 1299 on, was one which I show you two views because this right-hand view shows the original facade. And as it was built, it was expanded. And part of it, we're going to talk about this in a bit, it opens up into an extremely large piazza. Now that piazza is voided because in the 1260s, Tensions within this fledgling democracy, and this is typical of all of these fledgling uh, city-state democracies, were, this is going to sound remarkably, uh, remarkably appropriate to our day and age now, uh, were controlled by two major parties, uh, the Ghibellines and the Guelphs. And the Ghibellines saw loyalty principally to the emperor, um, a Saxon emperor, and the Guelphs saw primarily alliance with the papacy. So in each city state, eventually either the Guelphs or the Ghibellines would become the dominant party. And so in Florence in the 1260s, the Guelphs rose to ascendancy and banished many of the prominent Ghibelline families, including a family called the Uberti who had a major set of palaces and control in this city square, which was promptly raised as a marker of their expulsion. In other words, avoided space, which marked and, and, and uh, commemorated the uh, victory of the Guelphs over the Ghibellines and the expulsion of the um, um, Uberti family. And this is a piece that we will come back to. The cathedral, of course, is the other principal anchor. And you can see this is a cathedral which had taken. You can see the years of listed here. 
Okay, it's taken over a century to build. But when we talk about the optimism, we talk about a sense which resonates with our own modernist period that to think large, to think big, and to have faith that the generations coming after us would somehow or another solve the problems that we cannot. And the way that that worked with Santa Maria del Fiore was the church was started and it was envisioned to have this large domical space, this cupola, but they had no idea how they would ever span it. It took over a century for finally an architect, Brunelleschi, to figure that out. But that notion of we're going to start it now and don't worry, by time we're done with it, we will have solved the problem, gives you a real sense of that optimism. Now within these cathedrals, among the city-states, there was great competition. So this is Florence's cathedral and in the interior of it, you can see is this massive span, okay? Um, what you cannot see is some of the walls have murals on it. I will be getting back to that shortly, not of this particular cathedral, but we will be talking of that. But this is Siena's cathedral, and we will be returning to this cathedral. Siena was a competitor of Florence, each vying to become the dominant city in this section of, of the Tuscan, what we now, the province of Tuscany. Um, other major city-states were Pisa, uh, Pistoia, Prato, uh, but Siena and Florence and Pisa emerged as some of the strongest and the major competitors. Eventually, as you know, Florence wins out and becomes the dominant power. Now, here you have also one of these cathedrals that as we build it, we can create what shall we say, new open spaces that, don't worry, a generation from now can improve upon even further. And this is one where the principal nave of the building was constructed. And the building went back to about this far, the transept, and it had the beginnings of a dome. But of course, they realized, no, we can extend this even further. Now, what you can't see in this photograph is Siena is a city-state which is built on a series of ridges. So in fact, um, just behind this building, the land plummets and goes down about four or five stories. So how do you build a structure that can extend into that chasm? And eventually they do that. Um, in fact, they build their baptistry and build the apse end, the back end of the cathedral on top of that baptistry. And it's a series of extensions, but that's still not good enough. And if you look down this side, you will see, I've got to move my chat box here, excuse me. You will see an extension of the building. And we'll be looking at this in a diagram shortly. The CNEs had come up with the brilliant idea that they could take this massive nave and an extended back end apse and construct a new series onto this building that would make that the crossing instead of the major extension, make it what is called the transept. And what you're looking at, you get a good sense of scale with these cars and people. This was just an aisle. So you can imagine another aisle built over this way and there would have been a massive cathedral nave between the two. They got as far as this aisle. They also started the facade, which is about six of these bays down um, to the right on the screen. And then the plague hit. In other words, the bottom dropped out. So this notion of a cathartic stop to the progress of the Renaissance really had very graphic evidence. I'm trying to go forward. Oh, there we go. Um, besides these large uh, populous, um, what can I say, populous city halls and also these cathedrals, the point of the cathedrals were to, to give a single church 
unity over the entire city instead of just the power of each parish under each feudal lord. Another vector that plays in during this time is the rise of the mendicant orders. These were <coughs> monastic orders that instead of living remotely in monasteries were largely street preachers. And of course, the most famous are the Franciscans and the Dominicans. Uh, St. Francis and St. Dominic had died in the early 13th century and the institutions they founded immediately fit into this populist sensibility. So if you get a populist sensibility in terms of government, the rising guild democracies, and you also have a sense of populism within the religion, and that is these street preachers who speak directly to the people and in many ways circumvent the principal powers of, um, of, of, of the bishops and cardinals. Okay, they answer directly to the Pope. Now, these are churches that are primarily intimate spaces where you and 2000 of your best friends can get together and be participant in a three or four hour service. Now, we will return to some aspects of it, but unfortunately, Santa Croce was rehabbed in the 16th century. So entire networks of frescoes, these walls would all have been painted, were torn out and these later high Renaissance and Mannerist uh, tombs were put in their place. However, if you go down to the apse end of this in the transept, you'll find there are massive chapels which are decorated with frescoes, some by Giotto, we will be looking um, at some by Tadeo Gatti, but that notion of the painted church is really crucial um, to what will happen during the plague era. Okay. Part of the centralization and popularization led to, you know, massive programs of decorations. This is the cupola, the dome of the Baptistry of Florence, and it's a large mosaic. Uh, and it's one which you can see. Last Judgment, Genesis, Life of Christ, Life of St. John. In other words, it's multiple narrative layers and a central last judgment, okay? Now, this is typical of late Byzantine influences. Mosaics were associated with permanency. Mosaics were associated with wealth. So for Florence to be able to afford such a massive uh, mosaic in their baptistry, was something which was a major proclamation of, um, of Florentine wealth and Florentine regional power. Uh, the baptistry, we have to realize, this is also part of that communal sensibility that baptisms were in many ways, um, depending on your city, were either once a year or twice a year where you would round up all of the recent born and in a communal ceremony, they would be baptized into the church but in this type of city-state, there is also an unstated yet clear membership as membership of citizenry. So that combination, a communal baptism, as opposed to anything which was individuated. Now, the mosaics themselves, you can see, are fairly, what shall we say, they are not naturalistic. They are within a very Byzantine tradition. And if we look at some of the panel paintings from the time, this is an early painting of St. Francis. You have a mesh of what has a rather iconic sensibility of St. Francis. The notion that you're not trying to imitate nature, you're trying to provide a conduit for the spiritual. And the way, if you will think about icons, they differ from representational painting, because rather than representing their subjects, they manifest them. They give them a presence. So that spiritual afterlife of St. Francis is present through the painting. But Francis was a public preacher. And this notion of outreach to a population gives rise 
to the development of narratives. Here, the story of St. Francis's life. The new churches needed a lot of decoration and fresco to get their messages across. And with this notion of a more populous sensibility and a more accessible artwork, an artwork which more mimicked life rather than created some sort of theological statement really became popular. Now, you can see where this is going. The notion of a greater realism, a grounding in our world. And this is what modernists tend to focus on, a progress toward realism. So in paintings such as this nativity by Giotto, this is over in Padua, okay, um, the notion of a greater sensibility of living in this world becomes a very strong arc. Giotto, by all means, creates a much more approachable artwork. He even does things like has stand-ins for the viewer. In other words, figures with their back to them so that they are extensions of the viewership. These are the shepherds in the Annunciation of the Shepherd. And also the development of, instead of just juxtaposing figures, to create little narratives. So here you have the bath woman, either taking Christ for his first bath, a sign of baptism, or returning him to the Virgin. In other words, really that notion of a transition in time, as opposed to just simply an iconic juxtaposition. Now, of course, to later modernist eyes, ah, Giotto is playing with proto-perspective. And yes, that's a term that I have seen written many times, that he's trying to get perspective, but can't quite figure out how. And of course, this is something we have to be cautious of. Giotto is defining the narrative space around the actors, around the protagonists. And if you'll notice each vignette sort of is brought into juxtaposition with some narrative presence, but still the space around the shepherds is defined by the shepherds. The space around Joseph is defined by Joseph. The space around the bath lady, Salome, and the Virgin in Christ is defined by those figures. Um, the ox and ass are symbolic uh, Judaic Testament figures. Um, they too have a presence. Notice they also define their own spaces. So this notion of having narrative, having a clarity in the world, but allowing each one to be within its own space is very much part of this early 14th century sensibility. It's only in later centuries that people begin to try to force it into a linear pattern of perspective. Now, similarly, here you have a political allegory. This is a massive fresco uh, that is in the governing chambers of the city hall of um, Siena. And you can see it's a really a continuous fresco you can see that I've had to lop it in half to get it to fit on the screen. So yes, this city gate is this city gate. You can see that basically it's redundant from there through about here. So lock those two together. And it's the allegory of good government in the city and in the country. Now, even when I was an undergraduate, we were taught that this is a realism in the city and the country in that it really works in terms of perspective, and that Lorenzetti was trying so hard to get perspective, but then he screwed up sometimes, because somehow or another, the nobles who are going out into the countryside are further away than the peasants who are working the land, but the peasants are smaller. So that was explained to us when I was an undergraduate uh, as Oh, um, that's called reverse perspective. It means that uh, um, Lawrence Eddy kind of couldn't figure it out and get it backwards. Now, of course, that's nonsense. Because what we have is Lawrence Eddy is creating a hierarchy, a social hierarchy of large nobles and smaller peasants, even in this democratic state. Similarly, if we look at the space, we find that each space 
just as in the Jado, has a particular narrative in a particular space. And in fact, in the 1970s, Uta Feldges Hennings made the observation that if you look at the landscape itself, it seems continuous. But in fact, each of these farm groups is doing something which would be what are called the labors of the month, the entire calendar year. So that you have some who are uh, harvesting while you have some who are sowing. You have some which are preparing for winter. You have some that are preparing for the end of winter. In other words, it's a temporal collective brought together in a seemingly continuous space Yet each of these areas of space are separate moments in time. So it's a juxtaposition that gives an illusion of continuity, but fiercely retains its discontinuity that each of these vignettes is separate. All right. Similarly, um, when we look to this modernist notion of a progressive perspective and a progressive discovery, we find that Tadeo Gatti, who is one of the uh, Giotto's principal students, and this is back in Santa Croce, discovers that, aha, you can paint night skies. And this is always touted as being the first night painting in the Renaissance. Again, we have to be cautious for this because what Gatti is doing is really emphasizing the moment of the narrative the way that it is described by uh, the Apocrypha and, and, and the biblical text, you know, as a night. Now, these are images that lead up to the Great Plague, and they are viewed as one advance after another. And again, that's something which I hope I'm disabusing. The plague hits, and in 1950, 57, I think, Millard Meese writes one of the definitive books of the catharsis of the plague and talks about how post-plague, it reset the clock for the plague, uh, for, for progress. That according to Meese, if we look at post-plague images, they are much more conservative, much more retardataire, people get afraid, and they return to Byzantine formula. And very typically, or Kanye's work is held up as look at the example of this, look at how the figures, even though they are fairly sculptural figures, notice how really Christ in this divinity, what's called a mandala, notice that, ah, this is much closer to a Byzantine notion. Similarly, images such as Andrea Bonaiuto are shown as, look at this, space has been totally collapsed. We have these figures just stacked upon each other. And the notion of narrative has been given up for this sort of grand theological complexity. Again, viewed as a breaking away from the progress of Giotto. That notion then of progress, which is then stunted by the plague and only in the 1400s does the Renaissance restart. And that's exactly what I'm going to argue against. Similarly, Agnolo Gatti, this is Tadeo Gatti's son, so in many ways, uh, direct lineage of Giotto. Okay. Here we show, ah, by the 1390s, the beginning to return to form and the beginning to get more space. This follows a very similar formula to Giotto. And if you'll notice, it even copies Tadeo Gatti's notion of the night sky and the uh, Annunciation to the Shepherds. Ah, say the modernists. That's evidence that during this post-plague era, the artists lost all, what shall we say, all motivation to do anything creative and in fact fell back on copying. Sin of the world, copying. So here you have today Gatti, a presentation of the Virgin, and a generation later, post-play, Giovanni de Milano, presentation of the Virgin. And not only that, these are within two, you know, relatively close together chapels at Santa Croce. The standard line then being, oh, well, 
Giovanni de Milano didn't want to invent, he could only copy. And similarly, Paolo de Giovanni Fe does a birth of the Virgin. And what do you know? It is remarkably close and follows the formula of a generation pre-plague, Pietro Lorenzetti, Ambrosio's brother, a birth of the Virgin. This notion that originality is part of this inventiveness of the Renaissance. And we see this very clearly as, well, wait a minute, perhaps there are other reasons to be doing copies. And I have a whole, what shall we say, series of articles about that. But let me simply say the notion of creating a community of objects through repetitions is really the principal motivation um, across the 14th century. It's not just a post-plague phenomenon. All right. To that model then comes the, well, and it's only after 1400 that finally the Renaissance restarts through artists like Masaccio, okay, where you begin to have a very clear narrative set within a much more naturalistic perspectival space. And again, here, Piero della Francesca, just a generation later, and this notion of using deep perspective. Okay, this is the same generation as that Montaigne oculus that I showed you. The principal theorist on perspective that comes down to us is by a well, polymath, I'll call him. He's an architect, he's a writer, he, uh, he's a theoretician, Leon Battista Alberti. And this is one of his churches, the uh, Malatesta Temple, okay, um, in, in Rimini. And he writes the first treatise on art. And when I say treatise, it's not a how-to book, but rather some of the mechanics how-to, some history, and some theory. So it really is this rather complex weave that people very too frequently call, ah, the book on perspective. Now, he does elaborate on perspective. But for Alberti, perspective serves one principal function, and that is, to use Alberti's term, historia, history story-making narrative, okay? So the notion of clarity is not a spatial clarity, but an instructive clarity of storytelling. Now, let us return then to another notion. And this one gets into a little bit more of a tricky notion. I wanna introduce the notion of, um, of memory theater. Memory theater is a notion whereby one uses public architecture, and this goes back to the classical era, both in Greece and Rome, and is carried forwards by the fathers of the church, the early church. It is then carried forward heavily by the Dominican order, okay, of these populist orders. And in memory theater, one remembers things by first having a template in one's mind. And typically, what um, Cicero recommends is that one learns a piece of architecture. And then one takes a text that one needs to memorize and line by line assigns it to a detail of that architecture so that in your mind, you can walk through that building and call back each line one by one in order, okay? This is a memory trick that stays with us today in, mnemonic, in mnemonics, okay? There is um, a book by the name of, I think it's Moonwalking with Einstein or something, which talks about memory theater and how it is used by uh, people who memorize um, decks of cards and things like that. Okay, so it's a very locked sense of memory. All right. I want to suggest that it is exactly in the loss of population, and this is the principal thesis of tonight's talk, the loss of population 
revealed the cities not by what family lived where and the populations that, that were there, but rather by the frameworks in which they lived. In other words, the architecture, the memory theater architecture. I want to read a section from Boccaccio, who is writing in the 1350s, um, the Decameron. And he describes the horrors of the plague. And here I quote, but let us leave the countryside and return to the city. What more remains to be said except for the cruelty of heaven and possibly in some measure also that of man was so immense and so devastating that between March and July of the year in question, 1348, what with the fury of the pestilence and that so many of the sick were inadequately cared for or abandoned in their hour of need because the healthy were too terrified to approach them, that it is reliably thought that over a hundred thousand human lives were extinguished within the walls of Florence. Florence's population was around 120,000 at that time. Boccaccio exaggerates a bit, but Florence's loss would have been around 50,000, 60,000 citizens, all within a three month period, okay? Yet, and here's the point with the Boccaccio that I wanna pay attention to. Yet before this lethal catastrophe fell upon the city, it is doubtful whether anyone would have guessed it contained so many inhabitants. Ah, uh, how great a number of splendid palaces, fine houses, and noble dwellings, note he shifted to architecture, once filled with retainers, lords, and ladies, were bereft of all who lived there, down to the tiniest child. How numerous were the famous families, the vast estates, the noble fortunes that were seen to be left without a rightful successor? How many gallant gentlemen, fair ladies, and sprightly youths who had been judged hale and hearty by Galen, Hippocrates, and Aesculapius, to say nothing of others, have breakfasted in the morning with their kinfolk, acquaintances, and friends, only to sup later the same evening with their ancestors in the next world. Whenever I go into my house, whenever I pause to rest, I seem to be haunted by the shadows of the departed." End quote. Boccaccio is describing how with the vast loss of population, that the structures in which that population had lived emerged and became apparent, okay? This is a major shift in conceptualization of conceiving of a city in terms of its inhabitants to instead conceiving of a city in terms of the places where they used to be. I wanna suggest that certainly, and I've got to watch my slides here, okay? Certainly, if we look at Siena's Cathedral, after the plague, the notion of having this vast square, this partial aisle of an envisioned church and a facade, which is off to your right again, and having that empty space would be a constant reminder of loss. That the voiding of space became a marker of memory and the structures emerged. This also, oh, and here, is where you have a model of it. Forgive me for not having shown this earlier. So we were looking into this space here. That this is the same model that the Florentine Republic had in its mind when after, you know, booting the Uberti out of Florence, that they raised their buildings, created space for the people marking ever the expulsion of the Ghibellines. So that space becomes a marker. Now I wanna suggest that this is the fundamental understanding that we have to have of not the plague as an interruption to this linear progression of perspective, but rather the plague as a cathartic point which shifted people's understanding of the world from one occupied by people to the structures that 
really, you know, the structures underneath it all. So again, I show you the Giotto and again suggests how much of this is defined not as a unified space, but rather as a space which is defined around each individual. And similarly, the same in the Ambrosia Lorenzetti. And suggests that with the plague emerges this notion of a structure, an order, what eventually will become a, Cart a Cartesian order. Now I turn to Nardo Ciccione's depiction of hell. And this is in the Church of Santa Maria Novella, where we have, in fact, seen his brothers. Yes, Orcagna and Cione are brothers. Okay, and there's a third brother as well who's a painter. These are within the Dominican church, the church where memory theater was principally used by the preachers as a way of structuring a three hour sermon and then infilling it as one went through the process of memory theater. Now, for the first time, we have a depiction of hell, which is very similar to Dante's depiction of hell in the Inferno. If you'll recall from the Inferno, each area, each bolgia is assigned to a particular sin. Okay, and it's a hierarchy of sins. Now in Dante, it's a real, what can we say? It brings in politics, it brings in theology, it brings in history. It's a real mix, a populist mix in uh, the populist lingua franca of, of Florentine Italian, as opposed to being in Latin. Now, very frequently, there were questions of, Dante is writing this in the teens and 20s. Why does it take the painters until the 50s to start utilizing Dante? Now, there are several reasons. One, um, the, the text was problematic enough that it was popular enough and problematic enough that the church kind of put a damper on its use. They didn't ban it, but they did not really welcome it. But I want to suggest that the spatial structures that Dante uses give in many ways an early model that the plague then takes and makes necessary. Now in Dante, each bolgia has particular sin, but it's populated by specific individuals. So they are models of that sin. And they tend to be individuals who were known characters to the population, okay, either historical or, or within the city then. But if we look at Nardo's structure of hell, there's no way you're going to have individuals. There's no way to identify any of the specifics. All you can do is have the structure. And what we find is this is a major revision of understanding of hell. If we go back to Giotto at the beginning of the century, this is in the same chapel as that nativity I showed you. Here you have the last judgment, and you'll notice that the saved are all in a rather orderly, what can we say, sort of or an orderly order. How's that for a bad choice of words? Okay. But if we look at hell, it's chaos. If you recall back to that dome I showed you of the, of the baptistry of Florence, hell there is chaos as well. It's at the point of the plague that we begin to see structure emerge in these last judgments. So Nardo de Giones is one, and another one over in Pisa is in the burial grounds, um, and this is by either Francesco Treani or Bufalamico, Bufalamico, Bufalamaco, uh, depending on who you want to believe on this, it's a matter of contention. But in each of these, hell becomes a structure. Hell becomes not individuals, but rather categories. And I want to suggest that this is one of the first, wait a minute, we have a way of structuring memory. Wait a minute, with the loss of populations from our city states, 
we have a way of remembering the not the specifics, but we have a way of remembering the principal structures around which they operated. All right. Memory theater in itself is a very effective means of structuring because it's very flexible. The architecture that you learn so that you can memorize the Aeneid is the same architecture that you can strip of the Aeneid and then go and memorize, I don't know, the Iliad, okay? In other words, it's the structure that matters. Now, a plague scholar by the name of Samuel Cohen made the observation that, lo and behold, in the post-plague era, in the Renaissance, into that 15th century, the emergence of a new style building appears, one which is highly classical, highly mathematic, and undecorated, that the geometry is forefronted. Now, this is the church of San Lorenzo, and it is a church which is largely this stark sort of gray, what's called Pietro San, uh, San and also whitewash. It is one that if you compare it to Santa Croce, it is much more structural, geometric, and regular. Also, again, I remind you that Santa Croce would have been blanketed with frescoes, so the architectural features themselves would have been lost under the frescoes. Here you do not have that. And when I say it's a geometry, the height of a column is how far apart each column is, is how wide each aisle is. And if you look at this grid on the floor, you see that you can measure out spatially the church. If I said to you, how far away is the main altar in Santa Croce? You would be able to sort of guess only once you sort of guessed how far apart, maybe paced off each of these bays were. Whereas within San Lorenzo, you're able to say, okay, each column is around 15 feet. And then know that, what do you know? It's 15 feet to here. And that's another 15 feet. And that's another 15 feet above it. Oh, and how far away is the altar? You can just do the math. In other words, the space is geometric. And it's exactly this, which is then quoted in painting in terms of Masaccio's Trinity. Now, Masaccio's Trinity, what do you know? We're back in Santa Maria Novella again. This is that Dominican seat in Florence. And I put next to it an illustration um, from Alberti in his Della Pittura from 1435, which marks out how perspective works with a, you know, with a vanishing point. Now, several art historians have noted that one, um, let me back up. Alberti dedicates, by the way, his treatise on perspective to four artists, one of whom is Masaccio. So this notion of really perspective being used and shared in this particular era is very strong. All right, several art historians have noted that perspective certainly focuses us on the Trinity of Christ, excuse me, of Christ. You see this white dove, the Holy Ghost and God the Father. But they also have noticed that it sets off a space the flat part of the chapel is occupied by corporeal bodily form people. In other words, the Virgin, St. John, and then the two patrons of the, the Lenti family. But behind, once we get into the focus, the real focus of this Brunelleschian architecture, we go into a spiritual world, okay? an ephemeral Christ, I mean, an ephemeral God the Father, and an ephemeral um, Holy Ghost. And Christ is that mediator between the spiritual and the corporeal. And it's exactly at the focal point that this becomes clear, okay? 
So this notion of space being allowed to structure ideas that we have not otherwise a means of envisioning. Now, also, I want to point out that there is a corpse down here. And you can't read it, but the marker on it, and let me call it up, says, Io fu già quel che voi siete e quel che io son voi anco sarete. That which I am, you shall be. That which I was, I mean, that's what you are, I once was. In other words, a memento mori. This notion of then a transitional space, one marked by death. Okay, so that memory of the plague is there. Space then becomes, it's a construct in itself because of the plague. Here you have a contemporary of, of Mazzaccio's, Mazzolino. And here you have a painting which tells the story of the foundations of the Church of Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome. And according to the story, the Virgin decides that she wants a church. So how does she decide what size church to mark? She has it snow in a summer day in Rome. Okay. And here you have then a voided space. And this is one of those first voided spaces in this time one which clearly marks the space as, if you will think of it, it's kind of like the film Field of Dreams. If you build it, they will come. If you provide the structure, then it can be infilled with the substance. I'm trying to suggest that, of course, none of this would have happened had it not been from the plague. The plague provides the fulcrum which allows perspective to emerge as a means of structuring storytelling. I will finish with this painting. And this is by Paolo Uccello. It is the deluge and recession of the flood. It is in a cloister of, what do you know? Same church, Santa Maria Novella in Florence, the Dominican church in which memory theater was a strong and prominent presence. And it's a story, you can see one, that it's an incredibly compelling perspective. I mean, the vanishing point is just riveting. And it's the story of the flood, and then after the flood, the recession. Now notice, there is the vanishing point is that sort of liminal space, before which is all life before the flood, after which is only the life of survival after the flood. So this notion would have been one very poignant to a city which remembered the plague well and suffered several waves in decreasing amounts after that in the 1360s and the 1390s and 1400, okay? But perspective becomes in itself forefront as this liminal you know, point before and after. And I'm suggesting then that it is exactly the way of memory of before the plague and after that would allow it to have emerged the structures underneath the, you know, the realities of the world. In many ways, it is the plague that clears out the life of the cities and reveals the structures of the cities themselves and of course, what I am suggesting, it is exactly what in painting allows the call for a structure that can then be populated much as an armature in memory theater. So I will end with that. I will say perspective carries on, of course, and we'll leave it with this painting here um, and ask any questions. Ah. Now, let me get my chat box back up here. Oh, hello, Mackenzie. How are you? Oh, my goodness. Okay, so the current moment. I think this is exactly why this is an appropriate talk. We talk about the pandemic and we talk about recovery of the pandemic. So what does the pandemic reveal to us? that 
we kind of sensed, but didn't quite know. And now post pandemic really do see things in a different way. Anyone want to make any suggestions? Microphone's on. Hi, Dr. Girl. This is Mackenzie. I didn't know if we'd be able to chat or not. Uh, it's so nice to see you. <laughs> see you. Um, Hi, Dr. Yeah. Grillo, Jenny, and Doug Haber. We're in Mackenzie's class too. <laughs> oh. <laughs> all right, it's like a little 2004 up in here. Yeah. Um, no, so I think that's funny. A lot of what you're talking about, especially with memory and how we talk about time, I think we've all experienced and have heard people say like time isn't real anymore and like memories aren't real anymore. And so I think, yeah, I'm wondering what you think will happen in this kind of like fulcrum catalyst moment that we're in uh now and i'm asking because i work i don't know if you know i work at the school of the art institute in chicago now oh, um, and so i work with a lot of art history students but they're contemporary art history students and so it would be nice to kind of parlay some of this to them in a modern moment okay so i, I will say of course i'm not going to try to pre you know predict the future uh i may be foolish but not that foolish uh <laughs> however think of the things that have gotten shaken up we live in a society which, yeah, we have known there are inequalities in healthcare. We have known there are inequalities in certain aspects and racisms and such. And yet it's exactly when we start looking to how the pandemic has affected the population that it has thrown those into highlight. So things such as class structure, I think you're going to see um, possibly addressed more um, it certainly isn't going to be forgotten. Um, and the types of things that I think, I mean, I always hear, of course, oh, yep, it means that we'll stay on Zoom. I'm not so sure of that. Uh, but if you think of, okay, what are the things that we fall back on? What are the things that in this pandemic era, we really started doing in ways that we didn't quite realize that we were doing but now we'll take on a greater voice. Um, I am not so sure that how this will play out in an art school and in art movements in any way, but I think you're going to see emerge and please note, we're talking generations. How will this affect in 10 years? What are the types of things that could emerge from this? Okay, um, certainly a heightened sense of memory and if you'll think about how we structure time, um, you know, the uh, bombing of the World Trade Center, a pre-moment and a post-moment. This is a moment where, let's face it, this is going to be a moment in all of our lives, okay? What will be the social effects? And I think these are the things that, you know, stay tuned I think you're going to see certain reconceptualizations of the world emerge that we've sensed, but not directly addressed. And I think this will force us into addressing. So that's a very vague answer. In other words, I'm not going to try and predict the future, um, but I think start looking to, okay, what does develop? What has changed? And I think that's where it will be. And what do you notice is changing? what becomes much more of a constant. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I feel like I ducked the question, but that's okay. <laughs> so other thoughts? Maybe to build on that, do you think like architecturally and conceptually you'll see a change in the way people gather, like not just to work, but so socially, I mean, I, yeah. you're going to see a drastic change, I think, uh, you know. I, I think you're right on that. And it can go in a couple directions. Because, of course, it's touted with, oh, we're all, we're all now Zoom, Zoom accommodated. And therefore, you know, who, who needs an office anymore? And think of how many people are desperate to get back into social spaces. And yet, combined with that, a fear of social spaces. So I think you're right. There could be a much more flexible architecture that will emerge from this. And one that can be much more respondent uh, 
to sudden change. Um, and that's something, I mean, we have been forced to change radically fast. So does this allow, you know, will one of the things that grows out of this be a much more flexible sense of what architecture should be, a much more flexible sense of what work environments or social environments should be? Others? Okay. Um, Eleanor's here. Have to start video. Okay. Yeah, start your video. There they are. Can you... Hi, Hi, Michael. Hi. Hello, <laughs> there you are on the, on the steps. There you are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so this is all very interesting. Um, yeah, and nice to uh, hear, see, watch your presentation and see your students, former students. Um, so uh, I'm wondering um, if there is some analogy uh, to what is what has happened uh, in what you described in the structures. Uh, and, uh, I'm thinking of coral in the natural world okay. and how what they leave behind those structures that humans came to value. Um, and I'm also thinking of like, um, or in Bangor, the empty bank buildings, the empty casinos, and what's going to become of those? Like, will they turn them into housing for the homeless? Uh, you know. No, that that's um, a great question because we leave architecture. You know, we leave. I I know that there is this big. You know, if you in the New York Times is full of oh my God, the cost of real estate in Manhattan is plummeting. Um, what do, what do these spaces become? How do they get repurposed? So when we talk not just an architectural adaptation, but also an urban design adaptation, an urban use ad adaptation, I think that's a really valid question. Right. May I interject? There was an example I saw today of a town in Italy that uh, flooded was flooded to build a reservoir for hydroelectric production in, you know, earlier. So here, here we are. <laughs> and and ex exactly that, um, you know, the notion of, OK, what will be repurposed from this? So when I say it's brought out things such as, you know, um, we have seen greater class separation come about rather radically during this. I mean, uh, Mr. Bezos has made a lot of money off of us. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, what happens when we start talking about, okay, a shifted landscape economically and physically? So- On Mars. <laughs> I, again, we shall see. Yes. Yes. Can't speculate, can yeah. we? <laughs> no, but I, this is the moment of, now let's start paying attention to see what vectors begin to emerge. Okay. You know, that I think is the real. So asking how will architecture change, I think is a great question. Okay, how will our social spaces change? So. Sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly, uh, right. But maybe not Maine, maybe in larger places, <laughs> larger metropolitan areas. But no. Well, it's sort of interesting, <laughs> um, the office building where Eliza's company in San Francisco has had their offices, um, They it was a building that survived the San Francisco fire and the earthquake. And uh because of how it was built it's a beautiful building and they chose the seventh floor <laughs> and then they renovated it uh and they're like tech companies on every floor that they have a whole floor and um and it's it was done really well the renovation but yes. and i'm sure that like every office every floor then has a kitchen because that's the uh, buoyant had a kitchen so just you know, then, yeah, so what is it going to become next? Because the company's CEO, he left San Francisco, took yep, his family to Texas, of all places, but... Um, <laughs> but it's but exactly that, that, that repurposing. Yeah. And I mean, this right. is the thing of, okay, now let's see what vectors 
do change uh, what happens to all of this office space. And yeah. again, and, and just the history of that building, yeah, and yeah. all the transformations awesome. it's gone through, and yeah. what it, I mean that one building is an interesting story. Yeah. So, so in the chat, Paul Sheridan asked three slides back, flying saucers. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. I see him nightly. <laughs> so I just want to, I think this is one, if you'll notice <clears throat> very strongly what we have in it is, again, an emphasis on perspective, a means of, of suggesting diminution by giving discrete clouds. So <clears throat> this notion of, you know, okay, we can measure how far back in these cloud units and it parallels the architecture. And again, that development of voided space. So no flying saucers, but good measures of space. If I was the uh, Onions uh, art review editor, I would say the Pope goes golfing while Christ takes off for Mars or something, you know. <laughs> If I really wanted to be irreverent. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's a great headline. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you all, um, you know, for, you know, being part of this. Yeah. And hey, so, yeah. so one more question. Yeah, gladly. Oh, go. You'd mentioned before that post pan, uh, post, post plague, you know, you saw, a. Uh, uh, repeat of of um artist lineage artist lineage yeah. the late 14th century now to tie that into film do you think anything's happening now like there's zero creativity coming out of hollywood so you just see repeats of everything is this just <sighs> i okay so <laughs> you know one I mean, film classes i sat with you know for you <laughs> i mean if, if, if you consider you know, the, the whole thing of those repeats in the post-plague era is they really are developing what I argue in a very different realm is the whole thing is that this allows in many ways, it's sort of before the printing press allows for replication. And this way you can have multiple communities with the same connected image. Now we view it as, okay, it's just multiple images pre-printing but they're viewing it in a spiritualist way, one of, of uh, conduits among communities, allowing communities to have the same experience that are physically separated. And I think that's something you find across the 14th century is this notion of let's create multiples and this way it expands the community. Also, when we talk multiples, recognize that um, generation of Raphael they did multiples like crazy. So that notion of you know reproducibility, I think, is part of it. Notice I've ducked the Hollywood question. It's fine. It's it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's it is wonderful seeing you guys again. Yeah, you too. This is awesome. We have you to thank for our union 20 years ago. <laughs> so thank you. Well, <laughs> and things, are still, <laughs> things are still good and together, and that's good to see it. Yep. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all. Yeah, and stay in touch. Um, and Jared Cowan, yeah. Um, Bye. Thank you, Michael. Excellent. Thanks okay. for joining. Thanks so much to Dr. Griller for a really wonderful talk. And uh, have a good night, everyone. Good night. Thank good you. Night. Thank you. Take care.